Okay. Well, it is 6.30 and uh, welcome everybody. I hope that your sound is working, all that kind of stuff. Um, my name is Darby Love. This is our virtual gardening series and you are here at Shade Plants and Shrubs as per the screen. And I work out of the Nanaimo North Branch in uh, Nanaimo, the north end here. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the traditional unceded territory of the Stananas and Stanema First Nation. And we're not all under the same roof, so please feel free to put your uh, the territory that you're coming from or the town or region in the chat, which is kind of nice to do. And we also want to extend our heartfelt thanks to the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association for partnering with Burrell in the program. A really big thanks to Joe Canning, who is coming out of those, I think they're clematis flowers. Just, yes. Yeah, <laughs> she has this crown. So Joe is uh, was key in creating the program. And Richard, who's in the Hoya jungle, uh, has been the coordinator for the last, I think, three years. Um, so coordinating a bunch of adults is hard. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing a great job. Did you want to say something, Richard? Um, no, um, actually, just about Nick's presentation will be a small space garden design done by me. And that's on uh, July 8th. Great. Yeah, we'll send that uh, registration out for you mm -hmm. folks too. And um, just a few housekeeping items. So we are recording the session today, but uh, none of your voices or faces or names or anything are captured and it's just us on the panel and Jacqueline's screen and our voices that will be in the recording that we put on YouTube and our library site as well for people to watch afterwards. And please uh, make use of the chat feature with questions and comments throughout the presentation. But the, the big questions for Jacqueline um, should be put into the Q&A so that she can answer them at the end of the presentation, just sort of keeps things a little more contained. Um, but if you're like, what's that word she said? Richard or Joe will help answer you in the chat uh, right away. Okay, so without any more ado, Jacqueline Shirk, she is a 10-year veteran master gardener, and she has a two-year diploma in horticulture technology from Kwantlen Polytechnic University in Langley, BC. And before moving to Vancouver Island, Jacqueline operated a landscaping business in the Lower Mainland for 12 years. She has two national industry cert certifications through the Canadian Nursery and Landscape Association, one in softscape installation and another in ornamental maintenance. Jacqueline's also a certified arborist with the International Society of Arboriculture for the past 10 years with additional accreditation and tree risk assessment. Very neat. <laughs> and I'm going to turn it over to Jacqueline. Um, thank you, Jacqueline. Thanks, Darby. Hi, everyone. I'm Jacqueline, and thank you for joining us tonight for Shade, Plants, and Shrubs. I hope not to stumble too much as I go through my, my notes here for you. And I'll just start by clicking because I think this is the next thing I have to do is just move into the next um, screen. <clears throat> I think Darby already uh, explained this one and that this seminar is the property of the Vancouver Island Regional Library and Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association and is intended for educational purposes only. Uh, you can read that screen on your own and I'll just keep skip ahead to the next one. Um, I thought that I would start this uh, talk by introducing you to the greatplantpicks.org website. Um, it's a program of the Elizabeth Miller Botanical Garden in Seattle. And um, it's a site I often recommend and use myself. I think you will find it very helpful because it's precisely for our Pacific Northwest and because it contains many, many lists that are helpful for us in selecting plants for our Pacific Northwest Maritime Gardens. The area designated as the Maritime Pacific Northwest includes Vancouver Island and the BC Lower Mainland and also down into Washington and Oregon. The GPP Selection Committee is made up of horticulturists from BC, Washington and Oregon. Committee members include various manners of professional horticulturists including growers, garden designers, Arboreta and botanical garden managers, as well as owners of wholesale and retail nurseries. There's a picture of them on the website and there must be about 30 of them. 
Some of you here will recognize <clears throat> the names of Gary Lewis of Phoenix Perennials in Richmond, Gwen Odermatt of Petals and Butterflies Nursery in Langley, and Douglas Justice of the UBC Botanical Garden. And they're just a few of the GPP committee members. I think I go to the next slide. Here's just a sample of the few of the many engaging and colorful posters created by the Great Plant Picks Committee in the past. And these posters, and there's many of them, represent the list you will find on the GPP website. There we go, oops, excuse me, I gotta go back one. Um, the Great Plant Pick selections uh, are that perennials should be uh, hardy in zone seven and eight, long-lived, vigorous and easy to grow by a gardener of average means and experience, reasonably disease and pest resistant, having a long season of interest and preferably multiple seasons of interest, adaptable to a variety of soil and fertility conditions. We're not requiring excessive moisture with the exception of aquatic plants and available from at least two retail plant sources, non-invasive or overly vigorous in colonizing the garden or larger environment. And um, in addition to this list, they should be low in maintenance, uh, not requiring staking or vigorous deadheading. Trees and shrubs should require little pruning and nominal training. Bulbs should be considered long-term perennials lasting more than two years. Variegated plants should be stable and not excessively reverting. And I should also mention that the Great Plant Picks program recommends ornamental plants, which is um, my area of study. And I would note for you that fruits, vegetables, annuals, and also tender perennials that are not hardy to our zone are not included. The shade in your garden won't be the same as the shade in my garden due to your location and large plants and also buildings and other structures. Of course, we also realize that change that shade changes throughout the day according to where the sunlight is coming from and very much also throughout the seasons due to the earth's rotation. Dappled shade paints a pretty picture in the garden. I think it's a very desirable kind of shade. It could be a site under an open tree canopy. This might offer two to three hours of sunlight in a day. Dappled sunlight should offer that about a quarter of a, or a third of the sky would be visible through the foliage. Open shade and light shade are often considered interchangeable, but there are distinct differences. An area of landscape considered to have open shade is one that is exposed to the sky, but with little to no direct sunlight. This usually occurs when a structure or building blocks any direct sunlight, but the area does not have a foliar canopy over it. Light shade offers the most versatility for a wide range of plants to thrive. These areas receive about four to six hours of direct sunlight a day. And deep shade is dense with little or no direct sunlight, usually occurring from an almost impenetrable overhead canopy of trees with less than one quarter of the sky being visible. And I would comment there that there are few plants that can really exist in deep shade. Light is everything to the plants. If you have poor drainage, you will have a root zone that is suffocated due to compaction from sitting water. To rectify this, you will need to add organic matter. That's the OM. Not sand, don't make that mistake. Please do your research because sand will only exacerbate the problem. Organic matter could be composted garden waste, bark mulch or coir, or dry leaves. I don't personally agree with the use of peat anymore because it's an unsustainable resource that we shouldn't be harvesting. You could also raise the planting area even just by creating a mound or a hill. And you will also need to select plants carefully by understanding whether they are suitable for a shady site. And as we've just covered, there are differences in what constitutes shade, so that's important too. Lastly, Fungi generally prefer shade and moisture. They mostly get around through rain and splashing. They are opposed to sun and dryness. So fungal issues can become prominent in shade, especially where there's moisture. Mulching the surface of your beds will help to hold and slow the penetration of moisture into your soil and help prevent decay fungi from getting a foothold. Most gardeners struggle with plant selections for dry shade areas. Any dry site is likely to have poor moisture retention. 
is the moisture just disappearing into the soil or perhaps running off and not absorbing? If it's disappearing in quickly, you are quite possibly dealing with very sandy soil or loose gravel. If it's running off, it sounds like that soil is compacted and that could be due to, due to nearby tree roots especially large trees due to the tree roots sucking all the moisture out of the soil. Or it could also be compaction due to compression, which it could be attributed to an adjacent driveway, the use of heavy machinery in the area, or even just constant foot traffic. And I should also mention that hard rain and snowpack in winter are also sources of compaction. Again, you can improve your soil by incorporating organic matter. Large trees and shrubs are going to be very competitive for moisture and nutrients, so you might also consider thinning out the canopy to allow your shaded plants to get more light and have better growth so they can compete better and put the trees and shrubs at a less advantage. Mulching the surface of your soil is probably one of the best things you can do because mulch, organic matter, will hold the moisture and prevent runoff allowing the moisture to seep into the soil slowly. Again, if not, stressed plants are likely to attract insect pests and diseases, so be sure to select plants that are suited to the condition of dry shade. Let's just take a minute to talk about soil structure and soil texture because it's so important to understand how these two things impact the health of your plants. Soil structure refers to the arrangement of soil particles and the spaces between them. In healthy soil, particles are clumped together and have air spaces between them. In her book, Backyard Bounty, our MG Master Gardener mentor, Linda Gilkison, suggests we think of the appearance of the inside of a piece of chocolate cake. I could picture that right away, kind of shiny and full of bubbles. That's what you want the inside of your soil to look like, crumbly with spaces. These spaces allow oxygen in and carbon dioxide out and also allows water to drain through so that the plant's roots and the organisms living in the soil can all breathe. In addition to soil's mineral composition, soil should contain about 5% decomposed organic matter. We call that humus. Humus sticks or glues soil particles together creating the clumps. The structure of healthy soil that we understand to be beneficial to plant growth is destroyed by compaction, as I've just discussed. And also now we are learning through overworking, such as tilling. Deep tilling is no longer recommended annually because it destroys soil structure and breaks up healthy fungi associations. Linda Gilkison says she uses nothing but her pitchfork and she stirs in organic matter to the top part of her soil, never turning over deep. So when I was in college, we learned double digging, double digging a whole row and holding it at side and then double digging the next row. And then that first row went back in on top of it and so on down the line until you had dug the whole thing. You would only want to do that once in soil that has not been worked before. So we are no longer digging, rototilling our soil every year because we know that it destroys the fungal associations that are so important. Now I'm gonna talk about soil texture. This term refers to the proportion of mineral components found in soil. These are clay, silt, and sand. The smallest particles comprise clay. Silt particles are larger than clay and sand particles are the largest. Feel your soil's texture by just rubbing it between your fingers. Clay soil feels smooth and sticky. Sandy soil feels gritty and might contain small stones. Silty soils are somewhere in between. Clay soils are good for holding nutrients, but also too much moisture, while sandy soils drain well, but allow nutrients to leach through. Both can be corrected with the addition of, are you ready? Organic matter. The point is that organic matter is the life in and of the soil. Besides adding life because it's biologically active compared to mineral soil, which isn't, it opens up compacted wet or dry soil and allows moisture to permeate. Leaves are revealing. Every plant evolves somewhere in nature and their appearance is often revealing as to whether they evolved in sun or shady environments. 
Plants that thrive in full sun and plants that thrive in low light both exhibit distinct adaptations to their respective light environments, such as sun plants. Leaves minimize exposure to intense sunlight and this helps conserve moisture. For instance, a lighter color helps reflect intense light, protecting the leaves from damage. This may be light green, gray, or even silver. Think of the silvery leaves of the plant we call lamb's ear, Stachys byzantina, or the small gray leaves of dusty miller, Senecio cineraria. The light color reflects sunlight, reducing exposure, and the fuzziness reduces water loss due to transpiration. The larger leaves of shade plants are able to capture more light in low light situations. The larger surface area maximizes the amount of light intercepted and they're often thinner leaves because they need less protection from intense sunlight. This allows the leaves to absorb more light more efficiently in shaded conditions. One more thing about dark green leaves is that they have more chlorophyll, which allows for more photosynthesis. Isn't nature amazing? <laughs> I'm going to leave out some of the usuals. They are shade plants we all know so well. The hostas, the stilbees, primulas, bleeding hearts, hellebores, pucaras, most ferns and ivies, etc. There are lists of these plants everywhere, including the greatplantpicks.org site and many others we can all excise, ex access at our fingertips, including now AI. Have you talked to chat GPT yet? I've tried to include plants that I've actually grown or planted for others, or even sometimes just admired. And also some I've seen that I think are a little unusual and just too wonderful not to be known. I'd also like to talk, oh, sorry, just a second here. <laughs> I'd like to talk about Pyrus and rhododendrons before we look at some of my recommendations because I'm actually leaving them out except for one you'll see later. I chose to do this because they're both so well known and so ubiquitous in our landscape uses, especially as they should be in partial shade. Pieris japonica is a broadleaf evergreen shrub, very suitable for dappled and light shade areas. Sometimes you might have heard it referred to as Andromeda. That's actually a genus that Pieris used to belong to and it was reclassified. It's also called the lily of the valley shrub which is terribly confusing, such as common names tend to be. Pieris is known as the lily of the valley shrub because its flowers are tiny and urn shaped and resemble both the flowers of another plant called Convalaria, which is called lily of the valley, and Mayanthemum, which is also called lily of the valley, except that it's called false lily of the valley, while Convalaria is called true lily of the valley. And some folks just call it Japonica, which is totally incorrect, Lots of plants have the word japonica in their specific epithet, which is just a geographical term and means that they're from Japan or Asia. A lovely feature of Pieris is the color of its new growth. In two older varieties, Mountain Fire and Forest Flame, the new growth is dark red and pastel pink, respectively. I had a cultivar. Did I say what a cultivar is? Cultivar is a cultivated variety. A cultivar called Katsura, there is a Katsura tree, this is different. Katsura that has burgundy new growth. It was really gorgeous, except that I guess I had it in too much shade and it got a bug that overtook it. I had to discard it. Putting the flower similarities aside, note that of these confusing names, only Pieris, the shrub, is a woody plant, completely different than these other little shady woodland plants I mentioned that are herbaceous, meaning that like your hosta, for instance, they die to the ground in fall and are gone for the winter. I put a picture of the little bug there. That's a lace bug. And that's the bug that will destroy your Pieris if it gets stressed. It's a bug with a nose, a stylet it's called, like a mosquito or an aphid. And it sticks its little nose into the plant and just sucks the juices out of it. So it looks like stippling. The, the term is stippling. And it will really weaken your plant over time. While rhododendron is a vast genera, Pieris has just seven species in the whole genera. So do not stress this plant. It will attract the insect pest. It will move in quickly and suck the juice out of the leaves. Rhododendrons and azaleas. One of the books we use as master gardeners is the A to Z Encyclopedia of Garden Plants. It's quite huge. 
the A to Z Encyclopedia of Garden Plants indicates that there are up to 900 species of rhododendron in the genus. It includes azaleas. In other words, all azaleas are rhododendrons by genus. Did you know that? The genus is enormously diverse, but many species are woodland oriented and therefore suitable for most situations in shade gardens. Rhododendrons and azaleas that have small leaves indicate that they can take more sun, while rhododendrons and azaleas with large leaves indicate that they're from shadier environments. And it's the same with most plants, as I just said, plants that have evolved in shade to have larger leaves. It makes sense because all plants photosynthesize through their leaves and if in shade, they need more leaf exposure in order to get more light. Regarding the rhododendrons, I questioned my friend Verna Bueller. She's the former president of the Couch and Valley Rhododendron Society. And I'd like to tell you part of what she said to me. She said, rhododendrons require adequate light to set their buds, but they can't take the hot desiccating periods of sun, heat and drought and the same desiccation effects of wind and cold. Most rhododendrons prefer some shade. Planting under deciduous trees offer fine conditions, she said. And she also said that she has many rhodos in complete shade and that they're happy there. And then she told me that she's much more concerned with exposed rhodos than rhodos in shade. By exposed, I mean exposed to wind, sun, and drought. So be very site specific when choosing a roto for your landscape because there's so many of them and always understand the size and the culture of the rhododendron choice you're making. I've included just one rhododendron in this presentation, but there are many recommended that you can learn about online in the resources and including the Great Plant Picks website. Finally, we're going to talk about the plant. So I start with the conifers and moist shade. Conifers are generally large growing trees and form the overstory of our landscapes. Many species have been hybridized into smaller useful plant size for urban landscapes, including some that are bred specifically for hedges. Some of the conifers that do well in shady moist sites are natives to southern BC. Our native western or pacific yew is an understory tree that typically grows just two meters in more shade, maybe up to 15 meters in lighter shade. That's this plant right here. Uh, can you see my cursor? And, oh, okay, so there it is right there. And um, it's small enough to be considered a large shrub in certain areas. In deeper shade, it grows more open in its branching, but it's very attractive with its soft, very dark green needles and unusual red berries called arils. There's a picture of them there. Grand fir is the tree on the right, the tall tree there. That's uh, called uh, Aves grandis. And it's another native tree here. And it's local to my area in Lake Cowich and on Vancouver Island. It has beautiful conical shape and long waxy needles and very flat sprays. Many people though only know it as a Christmas tree because it is cultured for the landscape trade in commercial Christmas tree. Based on looks alone, Western hemlock is one of my favorite trees. It's my favorite conifer. It's very graceful, has drooping branches that lend itself to uh, grace and elegance, especially in snow. There are numbers of plants that are cultivars of these three plants. So if you're looking for a conifer for a shady situation, any cultivar of one of these species should work for you. But do be sure to read the tag. And if you're still not clear, use Google, or GPP or try AI. The hedge tree known as emerald cedar was the most popular hedging tree until fear of loss to climate change has caused everyone, it seems, to look in a different direction and are now choosing Leyland cypress instead. The emerald cedar is actually a cultivar called smarag of Thuya occidentalis, which is Eastern white cedar. Our, our native tree here, our big, forestry tree is western red cedar and it's very different than eastern white cedar. I wonder if that's part of the confusion that got everybody going on the Leyland Cypress. So the hedge tree known as emerald cedar was the most popular. It tolerates a wide range of soil moisture levels and in nature grows in areas of sandy or rocky soils. Remember we're talking about an eastern tree not the western red cedar. 
It also has a deep root system, whereas Leyland cypress has a shallow root system. Smaragd or emerald cedar also has a slower growth weight, which indicates that it requires less water and maintenance to establish. Of course, establishment is a term I'm gonna look at because it's always a factor in any plant's early growth. It will always say to you in any description of a plant that will be tolerant of sun or shade, that established once established. So always think about what does that term mean, once established. Before I go into that though, I'll talk about junipers because they're here and also the, the pine. I think I, I switched those around. Okay, I'll do the junipers. Lots of species in this genus and most are suited to drier environments. Did you notice I changed the screen there? So now we're on the next page. We're on the drier, we're on the drier side, right? Okay, um, they prefer sun, but being tough plants, they tolerate shade well. In the photos here, you see these blue tall trees. They're, they're like a hedge tree there. That's called Wichita blue. And uh, then you have this one here. This is one of my favorites in a little landscape shrub called blue star juniper. And then this one here is called blue rug. And blue rug can get quite large. That one's in a container. Looks like it's ready to be sold. <clears throat> you, you <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Mugo pine is a Europe. <clears throat> sorry. Mugo pine is a European conifer and it's very popular as a landscape shrub. Overused, but tough and practical. Often seeing it outgrown because if you don't shear it and keep it in that shape right there, you can bet it's going to get big and scrawly, <clears throat> especially if it's in too much shade. So keep it small by shearing it or clipping it. Clipping it. Sorry, everyone. <clears throat> English yew is a different yew than our provincial yew, the native one that I talked about that prefers moisture. So English yew, Taxus baccata, looks similar to our native yew, but it's more acclimated to drier conditions. It's a very good plant for hedging, exception shearing very well. <clears throat> it's the basis for the classic English hedge, which I've shown down here in the corner. Chosen for its versatility, ease of maintenance and year round appearance. <clears throat> okay, next slide. I'd like to go back to this word establishment, which is so critical for the success of any plant, whether in nature or in the planted landscape. Establishment ensures that plants not only survive, but thrive. Healthy root development, growth and vigor, resistance to pests and disease, drought and stress tolerance, not to mention visual appeal and the fulfillment of its functional role are all determined by a plant's establishment in your landscape. So I'd like to suggest that you adopt a gardener's mantra for the establishment of plants in your garden. The best you can do, sorry, let me go back. The best you can do for your plants to succeed will include, I thought I had this on a slide, but I don't, that you know the soil, that you know what the pH is, and you can correct it, and the level of nutrients in it, and you can correct that, and you know your soil structure and texture, and that your garden is mainly weed-free because weeds are highly competitive for resources such as moisture and nutrients, and that you've planted at the correct depth. The rule of thumb is that you plant at the same depth that the plant is in the container that you bought it in, or if you bought it in ball and burlap, same thing, planted at that depth. I would have to say, sometimes in ball and burlap, and I don't see it here on Vancouver Island, but they're dug with a machine and it pushes the soil up against the, the stem. So you might have to dig a little bit and just see because you never want to plant the stem of a tree or a woody plant down in the soil. So you should always be able to see that top root there. That you endeavor to water consistently without overwatering. That you provide additional nutrition according to the plant's needs. Therefore, you have to be educated on that plant's needs and that you will monitor your plant for signs of pests and disease and react accordingly. I suggest you get a hand lens for that. I personally have to wear glasses now that I'm older and I can't tell what's going on in a plant unless I look at it with my 10 times lens. But just a little magnifying lens will show you a lot more that's going on on the underside often is where you'll find some of these little bugs. And also that you will, when necessary, prune or remove dead, dying, diseased parts from your plant, 
especially woody plants, in order to help the plant develop upon only healthy and desirable growth. That's your mantra for looking after your plants. Okay, next slide is the deciduous trees that like moist soil. So first of all, the Japanese maples, Acer japonica, palmatum, and Sherisawanum. There are about 150 species of maple and hundreds, if not a thousand cultivars, especially in the Japanese maples. The A to C encyclopedia refers to the maples as a woodland species, often found in the understory and preferring partial shade and moist but well-drained soils. We could do an entire presentation just on the maples. This little tree in this corner right here at the top on the left looks to me like Acer Shear Swanum. And I had a cultivar of that one called Arium from my backyard some 20 years ago. And it was pretty much in shade all day, but it just glowed in the shade with its bright chartreuse leaves. Highly recommended. Vine maple is a native here on Vancouver Island in lower BC. It's an understory tree and therefore very suitable for shade. This is its leaves right here, which almost resemble a Japanese maple. They're very bright green and they turn crimson red in the fall. It can grow as tall as seven meters, but shade does slow growth. It's often multi-stemmed, which is a very nice habit for a tree in shade because it opens up the canopy and allows for that dappled shade. I also like to recommend Saskatoon or service berry, whatever you want to call it. It's probably your grandmother's tree and she made pies and berries from it. It's a BC native and I see it growing all over the area that I live here on the South Island. It just recently finished blooming along with the mock orange, which was just a little earlier, I think. And it's a small understory tree in nature considered four seasons because of its pretty flowers in the spring, vibrant green leaves that color beautifully into colors in fall. And I must also mention the edible blueberries that I said were famous for pies and jam. And the birds just love those berries too. Also dogwoods. We have a lot of dogwood here on Vancouver Island. I love our native dogwood tree, Cornus natale. I tend to call it nuttily. It has improved now that our climate has become drier. Previously, it was afflicted with anthracnose, a fungal disease owing to wetness, causes leaf spots, dieback, and death. No longer fear growing this beautiful, large growing cornice species. Just be sure to, over, to avoid areas of too much wet and shade, and avoid overhead watering and be on look, the lookout for spots on the leaves and prune it out. Dogwood shrubs are different than dogwood trees. So I've got two pictures of them here. This is the dogwood flower of the tree and this one here is the dogwood flower of the shrub. They're often, they're, they are much more thirsty, practically growing in water and often seen in boggy areas or along a shoreline. Their leaves are similar to dogwood trees but being shrubs they have multiple stems and have the attribute of colorful stems, which you don't see very often, both red and yellow, quite vibrant in winter when the landscape is otherwise dull. Note the difference in the flower types, both white, but dogwood flowers have much larger petals while the shrubs have smaller clusters. Lastly, Japanese stewardia is a beautiful little tree. Um, there's two species of it, actually another one is called Stewardia monodelpha, and I think they're both lovely, but monodelpha is a tree for a larger location. Everything about the tree is attractive. So here it is here, the flowers, if you can tell in the name, Pseudocamellia, Stewardia, Pseudocamellia, the flowers look like camellia. And this is the bark, it's very mottled, very handsome. I wanted to mention the meaning of broadleaf evergreens as opposed to just evergreen, which usually refers to conifers. And note that there are a few deciduous conifers as well. Um, the handout contains these lists and more general landscape plants suitable for shade. And where you see SPP, that just generally means the species in general. So I started with the strawberry tree here, Arbutus unido. So it's an Arbutus that is Mediterranean, as opposed to our native Arbutus here on Vancouver Island. This is smaller. Considered a four season evergreen due to its flowers, fruit and cinnamon colored bark. It prefers sun, but it does well in lighter open shade and it's drought tolerant once established. It likes shelter from the wind though, although I did see it growing as a hedge on Crescent Beach. Also note that the species plant is quite large, can grow 20 feet, but it's not generally available in, com in commerce. There is a smaller form called compacta, 
that grows to about six feet. So I think that if you're looking for a strawberry tree or Arbutus unido, you would be seeing that it is called Arbutus compacta and it grows to about six feet. Japanese skimia is one of my favorite plants, a true shade lover and readily available at nurseries. Skimia is one of those plants that is either male or female rather than both, which most plants are. It grows wider than high, maybe three feet high and four feet wide, sometimes larger with more moisture and sun. My preferred is the species plant, not the rubella cultivar. But it's out there, you can look at it and make your own decision. I like the white flowers in spring and the red berries in fall, but note that with the male plants, you get the flowers, but not the berries. I also love evergreen huckleberry, which is a native here on Vancouver Island. It's a slow growing evergreen that can grow to typically, when I say evergreen, broadleaf evergreen, that can grow to typically two meters, but Plants of Coastal BC, a book that I use quite often, says up to four meters. I have not, never seen one get that big because they're very slow growing. I see lovely, shiny, but small leaves with brilliant colorings and shades of red and orange. And it produces edible blue, back, sorry, blue black berries in fall. It can take some sun, but prefers shade and some moisture. Daphne Eternal Fragrance is a wonderful little plant. And there are other cultivars of this hybrid species called X transatlantica. In the photo there, you see this plant on a standard. So this is it right here. You see the round ball and you can see the stem there. So standards are very popular recently. Sometimes when I'm at the nurseries, I'm surprised at how many plants they've actually stuck on standards. So they're all grafted onto a tree-like stem, but it's also available in its natural form, which would mean it's that little ball that you see growing right out of the ground. The value of this plant is in its size, I think, two to three feet high and wide. It's long bloom period, spring to summer, and then sporadically. It's diminutive and pretty flowers, and also especially its lovely citrus fragrance. It's good in full sun and partial shade. If in sun, it requires some protection from long, hot, west summer sun. It also requires watering, especially during dry spells. Another cultivar of Extrans Atlantica is called summer ice, and there's probably more than that that I'm oh, not aware of. <laughs> Um, sweet olive, Osmanthus delavii is a, is a little shrub I had in my garden and I thought it was really delightful. Osmanthus is evergreen, broadleaf evergreen and has very fragrant flowers been compared to apricot. Uh, the hot flowers are highly attractive to pollinators. The biggest difference is size. This plant can be foundational in your landscape growing up to three meters. I've even seen it hedged, although you tend to lose the flowers and it's fine in sun or part shade, and it is drought resistant. Deciduous shrubs. Uh, this is the rhododendron that I mentioned that I would include. Certainly not because it's the nicest one, because I don't think that one nicest one exists of rhododendrons. There are so many, not just nice, but outstanding. Um, this one is called Royal Azalea, and it's a deciduous. So it's in the azalea group. The deciduous azaleas are just wonderful shrubs to have in your woodland garden. Mostly they also take full sun, but bloom just as beautifully in light or dappled shade, and their flowers are fragrant with a spicy fragrance. Great Plant Picks calls this plant first class because it's so graceful and showy with its pale pink lavender blooms. I was a volunteer in the past at Darts Hill Garden in Surrey, a place you should visit if you go to Surrey. I would see people lined up to take pictures in front of this large plant spring through fall because it additionally has beautiful fall color and this is right here the the fall color i hope you can see that better than i can <laughs> it's quite large up to about eight feet it occurs naturally in korea and is the national flower of one of their provinces red bud hazel is another small tree plant shrub that i know but it's not that well known in uh commercial commerce I've seen it at Dinter's though. I've grown this plant and enjoyed it immensely. It's a small tree, if you will, more shrubby, I think. The flowers are insignificant, which means tiny and obviously not showy. So the flowers, you're not buying this plant for the flowers, but the leaves and the fall color make up for it. Heart-shaped leaves, note to MGs, the species name Circidifolius tells us that it's like a Circus. The bluish green leaves are heart-shaped and adorable. 
and the fall colors are in shades of red and purple suffused with orange. It's a true shade plant and requires moisture and organic soil. Virginia sweet spire is this one right here with these long droops called racemes. It's a small shrub, but enticingly elegant in its drooping habit. In nature, it lives along stream sides, so you understand it likes moisture. The flowers are creamy white racemes, see the photo there, and are very attractive pollinators. Like the red bud hazel, the fall colors are beautiful, deep shades of red, orange, and purple. I also love Carolina allspice, calicanthus. It's a much larger shrub than the two just mentioned and hails from southern U.S. and in the right conditions can exceed 10 by 10 feet. The lightly fragrant flowers are maroon colored and quite unusual in appearance. So this is them right down here in this row of three. Uh, that is a little unusual looking, isn't it? And uh, the fall color is yellow and that is a color we love to see in shady circumstance. I don't know if I mentioned those uh, uh, flowers on the calicanthus are fragrant as well. And lastly, buttercup winter hazel, Coralopsis, has bell-shaped fragrant yellow flowers, and it's a nice yellow, a buttery yellow, blooming even before the leaves emerge. Reminds me of Indian plum, Omelaria, that we have here. It's one of the first plants to bloom in the spring. It blooms before the leaves emerge. I had buttercup winter hazel in my garden, and it was a welcome sight in such early spring. It's medium-sized shrub that truly prefers light shade to sun. And it also has nice fall color, yellow. It might be harder to find in a nursery, nursery than it is easy to grow in your yard. Perennials for damp shade. Cobra lilies are very unusual plants that thrive in shade. This one, the Japanese cobra lily, is large compared to most I'm aware of. The leaves are very large and have interesting markings. Can you see it right here? Aracemas aren't hard to grow. They just require consistently moist soil in shade, well-drained, and they like rich soil. I tried to bring the one from my garden when I moved from Surrey. I thought I dug it up, but I guess I didn't bring it. And I was so sad about that. I loved it for its big leaves. It really has big leaves. And then you see the spathe comes out of there like a giant marshmallow and it rises up. Oh, I know this plant is often called Jack in a Pulpit. Maybe some of you have heard it by that name. And there's smaller, there's smaller erysemas. There's quite a few of them, I think. But I really like this one because it's big. Um, the umbrella plant, Darmera peltata, is a plant that really likes moisture, even practically in water or bogs. Its leaves look like umbrellas. This is it right here. And its flowers grow tall very quickly and then bloom on pink balls at the top. It can make quite a clump in time. So if you don't have the room, be aware of maintaining it to a size that's reasonable for your garden. In my garden, the umbrellas were about two to three feet tall and the flower stalks grow a little bit taller. There aren't too many shrubs that are completely herbaceous, herbaceous meaning dies to the ground, but goat's beard, actually called Aruncus, is one of them. Or so it seems to be a shrub owing to its appearance, but it is actually an herbaceous perennial. At the end of the growing season, it dies to the ground, this is it, Sorry, this is it right here with the big white flowers on it. At the end of the growing season, it dies to the ground and then it emerges again the next spring and grows into a shrub. Besides the name goat's beard, owing to its flowers, as you can see, it's also been called giant astilbe, which I think is a good name for it too. And I can agree with that name. There are dwarf forms, but the species plant can grow five feet or more in a season. It's also good in sun, as long as there is consistent moisture. Regersia. Is there another name for Regersia or am I just missing it today? They are so striking. I love all the Regersia. So this is the one right here with these pink blooms. Very structural, heavy, coarse leaves with rugoseness in them and sturdy stalks, including the flowers. The one in this photo is my favorite. It's called Bronze Peacock due to the colors in the leaves. Yellow Wax Bells, Coringashoma, is another plant that's a herbaceous perennial. See it down here? Just like goat's beard, it comes out of the ground like your hosta in spring and starts growing into this massively large shrub, about five feet high and wide, gone in winter. I love the soft butter color of the flowers that bloom in late summer, late summer, which is nice because most shrubs, plants bloom early in the year. And how nice it is to see something blooming at that late time. It likes rich soil, as do I think most of the damp shade plants. 
for dry shade. Oops, I think I, sorry about that. Epimedium is usually the first plant people think of when called to suggest something for dry shade. Great plant picks list no less than 29 varieties of epimedium. They are tough and reliable perennials often thought of as a ground cover. They tend to clump rather than run. Some are Mediterranean and others are Asian. Naturally then the Mediterranean types you can imagine deal with drier soil. From the photo, this is it right here, and there's tons of them, this is just one pretty one. Um, you can see that the heart-shaped leaves that are so attractive and there's so many variations in their coloring. You can literally take your pick. This little plant over here is called white wood aster and it's a little shrub I enjoyed in my garden. Almost in complete shade, it bloomed reliably and profusely with these little lacy aster flowers, again, in late summer. It only grows to about two feet high, so you might like to plant a few together for more impact. Saxifrags are plants that can seed and succeed in full shade, not fast growing and therefore being the shorty that it is, this is it right here with this weight on it. This one is a dwarf, I think, isn't it? Mini London Pride, yeah. Um, for dry shade areas, but don't forget to keep it moist during establishment. This plant spreads by stolons, which are the same as what you see from your strawberries. Stolons are stems that run along the ground. Then hardy cyclamen, a little harder to grow, but wow. It's the cousin of the house plant we just call cyclamen. You likely recognize it, and it's just as adorable as that tender variety. Native to the Mediterranean and like some dryness, but not in sun. Because it's quite small, you would want to have it in a spot where you can easily view it, such as a raised bed or a rockery near a walkway, I think. It blooms in very early spring or late winter, actually. The leaf patterns on cyclamen are very unusual and they have pink to amethyst colored blooms. They seed quite easily and then spread gradually over time. <clears throat> I've just chosen a few grasses to look at here. More grasses prefer sun than shade, but like some other plants, they can tolerate and even perform well in shade. If they don't, what you will see, <clears throat> likely see, is a plant to open up and flop over. Bold's Golden Sedge, Carexyleta, is a plant I learned in college and it was highly recommended by my teacher. I planted it and I liked it. It's really yellow, this is it here. So it really lights up in shade. It's a very bold looking grass and makes quite a substantial clump. Although it's not tall like a Calamagrostis, Carl Forster, I think you might know that one by, or some of them is Canthuses. And it doesn't require a lot of moisture, but neither does it like it dry. Northern Sea Oats is another plant I learned in college and decided to try in my shady garden. I really liked it and I'd like to grow it again. It has bright green leaves and showy seed heads. They're oats and oats are nice. Can you see them over here? You can see them dangling. They're, they're large and dangly at the ends. Sea oats don't just tolerate shade, it likes shade. It also likes moisture. I had a shady, damp yard, so I'm not clear on how well it does in drier soils. Japanese forest grass or Hakanakloa is pretty well known in gardening circles since its introduction to the market some decades ago. For a grass in shade, you really can't beat the beauty of this plant right here. It's a moisture lover for sure, and with enough moisture, it will be fine in sun and grow quite large. There are several cultivars, but my long-standing favorite is definitely the one called Areola. Ground covers. We're getting toward the end here, folks. There are more ground covers that I wouldn't recommend than I would recommend. Just the word ground cover tells you something about the nature of the plant. It's likely to be a spreader, and you may not manage it well enough to keep it in control. Considering that we all change residences from time to time, the new owner of your property may let a terrible plant escape into nature where it can do a lot of damage. So I hope you will view our presentation in this series called Invasives in the Home Garden and learn about some of these troublesome plants. Or you might also visit the websites of the Invasive Species Council of BC. I have three ground cover plants here that are either native or otherwise acceptable. And by that, I mean well-behaved. Sweet woodruff or gallium is a lovely little spring flower. Here it is right here. With bright green leaves and profuse white flowers. It's a spreader, but not aggressively. I don't mind it colonizing around my shrubs because it does no harm like some ground covers do running through and taking over the whole garden. Gallium definitely prefers moist shade or at least enough moisture and it will become dormant 
in summer. I've never grown vanilla leaf, but I hope to get around to it. It's native right here on Vancouver Island, and my book of plants of coastal BC indicates that it doesn't appear to grow on the mainland. So I'm wondering if maybe it's just been choked out by the development over there. I see this plant spreading so nicely through the shade in many places along the Canada trails that I walk with my pup. However, I'm not sure that it's readily available at all nurseries other than native plant nurseries. I know there's a new nursery in the Crofton area called um, West Home, West Home, a new nursery called West Home. And we need new nurseries on Vancouver Island. I'd be pleased to hear your comments about vanilla leaf because I think it's really attractive. This is this one here with the triple triple leaves and then they, that's the flower. Pacific Bleeding Heart is our native bleeding heart and it's quite pretty and really underrated. We are so used to show your plants in the Asian bleeding hearts, the cultivars of Dicentra spectabilis. My favorite bleeding heart of those ones is gold heart that has the yellow, they're gold leaves, and also Valentine has the red flowers. You likely have your favorites too, but I find the Pacific bleeding heart really fills in, so it could be used as a ground cover, and I think that um, it's nice to add native plants to our garden. Uh, oh, I think I have a hidden slide. Sorry about that. Oh, I don't know how to get it back. I don't know how to get that back. I don't think I can. So I was going to tell you about the maidenhair ferns, which I think you do know. Um, they're the ones that are, uh, they have very delicate fronds on the very fine black stems. And it's a plant that likes moisture in almost any amount of shade. I had put one near the outflow from my clothes dryer and it grew <laughs> quite magnificently large. Uh, so I take from that in addition to the shady location that, um, uh, maidenhair fern actually likes the warmth and moist air. And I had a picture on the slide that I think is hidden um, of another maidenhair fern called Vestunum, that Venustum, sorry, Himalayan maidenhair fern. It's much smaller, has a spreading habit, and is useful in shade as a ground cover. I saw it at Free Spirit Nursery in Langley, and it was very successful in that kind of a location. So that's one you could be aware of. It's not a tall plant at all. It works as a ground cover. It's maidenhair fern, but it's the Himalayan variety. I like autumn fern as well. It looks like it's autumn and spring, thanks to the orangey leaf colors of autumn fern. It's only about two by two feet and always looks nice. It can take any amount of shade, but again, requires a moist environment. And I, mm, I have royal fern here. I'll just move on to the tatting fern, um, which is actually a cultivar of uh, the lady fern called Frizzlelay. And it's also been called Mrs. Frizzle's lady fern. It's a very small fern, about one foot by one foot, 30 centimeters, likes moisture. And I think it best suits either being somewhere in proximity to being noticed or planted in multiples or in a raised bed. So in conclusion, I realize I've left out some groups you might have wanted to hear about. So I remind you about the GPP website and many more that I haven't mentioned. And as I'm wrapping up here, I'd like to say that I hope you will choose to lose, use at least some native plants in your garden. As master gardeners, we've been learning and understanding more about the value of native plants. In more situations than we are presently even aware of, native plants are important because they support insect life. Insects, it turns out, often need the plants they evolved with to lay their eggs on, and doing so, in doing so, they support the next generation. Birds re rely on insects to feed their young, and so on up the food chain. We need to get back to what really matters to the local ecology and all do our part in helping to save the planet. As gardeners, that is something we can all participate in. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you Ready so much, Jacqueline. Yeah. Lots of enthusiasm and very organized. I like it. <laughs> Great. Um, April's just gonna launch the poll because she got um taken away by other things in her branch. Um, so you can do that. And then please put your questions in the QA. And we'd love to, we've got two already. We'd love to see some more. Okay, so uh, we've got two uh, questions about YouTube and handouts. So we'll re 
once uh, the presentation is processed, we send it out with any uh, handout materials for you again. So don't worry, Jan, we will be sending that out to everybody as well. You can also go to our website, viral.bc.ca slash gardening, and then you'll find all of the presentation stuff there. Okay. Any comments on using Mahonia in the garden? For, from me, I think Mahonia is a great plant. I, I think it's very reliable and um, I think it uh, it's a good, it takes dry very well. I've seen Mahonia mostly in sunny situations. So it's a, it's a good, tough plant for sure. And you know, there's tall, tall Mahonia and then there's a short Mahonia as well. You take your pick. I planted and, and, uh, the, and the hummingbirds love the flowers. Yes, in the yeah. winter time, it gives them uh, food for the winter. Yeah, yeah, oh, great. Plant. Happy comments on Mahonia is what I'm hearing. Well, you have the flowers, which are really beautiful when nothing else is flowering. So it's it's a gorgeous plant. Well, it's not a gorgeous plant to have to clean up. <laughs> <True> <laughs> a landscaper. <laughs> Those dry leaves are really prickly. You want leather gloves for being around Mahonia. Yep. Okay. Uh, Carolyn says, I'm also a big fan of skimmia. What are your thoughts on Brunera, Sweetbox, and Japanese painted fern? Oh, okay. So Sweetbox is, um, uh, uh, sorry, the it's cocoa. the Sarcococa. Yes. So it's a great little plant for shade, isn't it? And, you know, mm -hmm. people use it in, in actually it works in quite dark situations, surprisingly. And it does spread nicely. It it's not, it spreads. It doesn't go rampant, but it does spread. If yeah, it, it suckers likes a little. the conditions. Yeah. So it, it, it can be a small hedge. I've, I've never seen it grow that tall, but it's, a, you know, it's a very, it's a very useful plant. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, Bruner, uh, Brunera. Oh, Brunera. Oh, yeah. I just. Yeah, so Brunnera is a great plant. It's one of the most common ones I think that we think of for shade gardening. And um, I think Brunnera can take it pretty dry as well, which is uh, is good. Um, the flowers are really nice. You know, when I was at Dinter's one time, they had a, they had a sale <laughs> on a table of a Brunnera called uh, stained glass, I think. And I, th I thought, well, I'll just try that one because it, every, it, we always get Jack Frost, right? It's Jack Frost, Jack Frost. So I got this one and it's, it doesn't have the, the silver markings on it, but I really like that one. And I'm going to go get some more of it when I can find it. Now, Brenner is a tough plant. Again, I don't like dealing with it as a, as a, as a landscaper, as a gardener, because those leaves are really rough. <laughs> well, one thing, one thing for a lot of our gardens is that um, you only have one or two. Yeah. With a landscaper, you know, it's like 50 and they That's all right. <laughs> they all compete on who can bite you the worst. Who you wants know? to do the brother up? Nobody. Yeah. <laughs> Did we talk about Japanese painted fern as well? Yeah, I like Japanese painted fern. I, I um I think that, uh, you know, again, that's a kind of plant that you want to have close to where you can see it because it kind of fades into the background um, when it's uh, farther away. It's not, it doesn't have a really bold expression, but it no. does have, have very pretty markings. Uh, the, 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 the colors in the leaves are very nice. Especially Most if you put it up against are, something. are definitely for, for moist too, right? Shade. Yeah. 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 But I, as, as pretty as they are, um, as you say, you, you have to get so close to them, don't you, Jacqueline? Um, whereas I like I like the larger ferns that just reach up and speak to you. Yeah. No. Yeah, it's, a, small, it's them, a smaller one. If you're planting them in a border, you would put them up close to the, the front of the border, which would actually be not too bad, but something darker behind it would be great. Yeah, that's a good idea. Or or have enough of it, maybe maybe three together or something, so you've got a little more impact there visually. Right. They're good ideas. Uh, there are some deer questions. Mm. Uh, what do deer not like? Well, my experience, because I never had a problem with deer in Surrey. <laughs> <laughs> Here on Vancouver Island, I certainly have deer and elk in my yard in Lake Cowichan. So what I have found is they'll try a little of everything. They never actually ate any of my skimia or the Syracoco. They don't seem to like the rotos. No, they don't like the rotos. The, the 
Bambi sometimes will take a little chomp out of them, but yep. as soon as they, they get it in their mouths, they, they don't do it again. Yeah. Yeah, so I, if you um, go on the on the Great Plant Picks website, they do have lists for, for deer. Yeah. Well, that's a great, great idea. So yeah. this is a... Um... This is a, an every every presentation question because yeah, it's, and it's I hate such to a say, problem you know, here. This, this plant will get eaten by deer because what my experience is that you know they will try it, they will they will nibble things. So you leave it out, and you're so disappointed when you come out and you see that your your young Pieris has been nibbled down to the wood, you know, by a deer probably. And elk are worse. I don't know who has elk, but my goodness, they step on things with their big feet, and they they just pull things out of the ground. So that, you know, if you come out, all your pots are tipped over. It's just so damaging. I can't Those believe it sometimes. ugly thugs. Not everybody well, has elk. Also, <laughs> people, will, people will plant a young plant in the spring, of course. It has all this lovely new growth. And the that's when the deer will nibble things. And if you net the new plants, let them develop their darker leaves, be a bit more hardy then they don't get quite as decimated. And uh, um, deers will, deer will like different things on different years and different, different areas, depending on what else the deer eat because they're browsers. And uh, um, I just got to netting things. I've, I've had deer come and eat the daffodils. Yes, they don't like them. They, they just go, oh, look at this, munch, take the head off the daffodil, spit it out, go to the next one. So it really depends. They're looking for everything. And so when people say, oh, the deer ate everything in my garden, no, they nibbled everything in the garden. Well, the other thing is the deer will follow their, follow their mothers around and eat whatever their mothers are eating. So they actually do a track through your garden and you can pretty well see where they've been and they'll come back that same track the next next day or the two days later yeah yeah they, they have definite trails yeah yeah now uh, someone's is someone's yeah. asked about um clearing an overgrown weedy and grassy shade area before planting hmm. what's the question joe um, what's the best way to clear overgrown and weedy, grassy, shady area before oh. planting? Well, I guess it's the cardboard uh, treatment uh, or covering it up um, with you know, newsprint. I mean, cardboard, it doesn't break. They say it does. I don't know. It depends on what cardboard you use. I find that challenging. You could just get a sod cutter. <laughs> well, the other I, I uh, will often, if I have an area like that, um, I will throw down eight to 10 inches of any kind of mulch I can get. And it just kills everything underneath. And then with your pitchfork, you can turn it over and you've got, you've got the soil you need, but it's not going to happen in, in five minutes. It's yeah. something that you do first season and cool. then you, you, you have soil in the next season. The other thing is you don't want to put anything down that will occlude the water from getting down to the, the trees that are in that, that area. Moisture. Yeah. So, you know, a mulch would probably be the best idea. Unless it's yeah. out in the open, then you could use your whatever. That's interesting because we know the garden professors are saying no to sheet mulching, right? But I know that right. um, sheet mulching is still really popular, even with the native nurseries as they're trying to recover areas to grow plants mm -hmm. in they're, they're recommending cheap mulching because I I did it I did a, a an interview with them to talk about you know what I have a large area in back of my property that's about 20 by 40 feet and it was just covered in a plant called lemon verbena no lemon right lemon, right lemon balm or lemon verbena yeah yeah, yeah. lemon balm yeah, yeah. like it's like a mint yeah. or something right a real yeah. runner yeah, yeah, so I just thought, you know, it's a lot of space to have to cover with cardboard. Boy, I need a lot of cardboard for that, right? And then I thought, you know, I know that um, the garden professors are not even recommending that, that it suffocates the surface of the earth. Yeah, and that's, and that's why I, 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 when I've done that, I've gone to a nursery and just bought the shredded fir mulch and then 
every time I'd get some something to throw down, I'd throw it down on top. And in a season, everything's done. And then I don't have to deal with chopping up whatever uh, sheet mulching um, is still there. You know, I, I only want to do the work once. And I found when I have tried sheet mulching, first, first of all, it doesn't work as well. And second of all, I've got to deal with the leftovers. And with, with, a, with a good arborist mulch, just a cheap, undyed mulch um, from the um, garden center, works every time. Well, the other thing you don't want to do is disturb the so soil surface. Because the minute you disturb it, you bring up more weed seeds to the, mm -hmm. the, the top. Right. I don't know if there's any real good answer, right? I mean, there's these are all methods, but they all have their drawbacks as well. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. It's a I hope we answer that. <laughs> Sometimes even just knowing that there isn't an obvious answer can feel really nice when you have a question. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in, when you're in the commercial trade, it's, uh, you know, people want a garden, then we rent a sod cutter and drive that thing around and load up the sods and you can turn the sods over they can they can compost so it's not doesn't have to all be taken to the dump but um, right. it's kind of the quickest way to go when people want something that's more instant than waiting till next year that's true and turning the sod over you're putting you're putting the greenery into the ground so it's mulching and you're exposing the roots and that kills them yeah. Well, the other thing is you can get rid of some of the grubs in there too at the same time. Right. right? The birds, the birds and will robins be will be down there. <laughs> <laughs> um, can one of you uh, do a quick overview of what sheet mulching is for? So, uh, Lauren has asked for clarification. Okay. So sheet mulching is using cardboard or paper and laying it over the surface and then covering it with a, a mulch of some kind, like a wood chip or any compost. And um, and then just letting it break down naturally, and it does work, but it takes time, and it takes quite a bit of product. Mm -hmm. Did I get that right? Because you yep. wouldn't use any plastic yeah, or anything. It's, yep, it's pretty exactly. Simple. It's pretty yeah. simple. Yeah, and that's why, and that that's one thing that Dr. Chalker Scott says is why why do it twice when the mulch alone will do the same job? All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should have put uh, the website for the uh, Garden Professors. I think it's just gardenprofessors.com and they're also on that, Facebook. So they have lots right. of really great information. Great. Uh, Jan has planted several native plants, naively think the, thinking the deer would not chomp on them, but they're decimated. Oh. <laughs> and she's listed what they were. Uh, it so sounds like the suggestions from earlier would apply Two that Joe is saying, fencing them off till they get a little more established, or? That's probably a wise move. Just yeah. fence them off or put some something over top of them so the deer don't get them, get at them. I, it's disappointing because it's not something I had to deal with in Cloverdale, but you come here and everybody's got wire around the plants. I think that doesn't look nice. <laughs> no, but, but you didn't have the ravenous like, yeah. deers. Yeah. When I first moved here and you saw the cedar hedges and they were all really narrow at the bottom, you're like, what the heck did people do to their hedges? It does not look good. Browse. <laughs> Vancouver Island's beavers. Yeah. Uh, Sabrina has an interesting uh, question, uh, Jacqueline. Um, she's having some trouble with her hydrangeas and it sounds like she's got a couple of problems going. Um, she says, uh, hydrangeas in light shade, no leaves on the branches. Notice there's a circle of new leaves at the bottom of the plant. Well, um, winter kill? It, uh, it sounds like winter kill to me because if they're regrowing and oh, they were growing last year, um, then it sounds like they took a hit. What do you think, Jacqueline? I, I can't understand what you're saying. The, the hydrangeas are uh, have lost their tops. Yeah, they have no leaves on the branches, um, but, but she's, she's seen some new leaves at the bottom of the plant. 
and I wonder if they didn't get um, a winter kill. Oh, well, then I think that, that what you have to try is just to cut back to that new growth, right? Yeah. yeah. And go with that. The one thing you won't get, though, is flowers this year. Probably not. Yeah, unless it's one of those repeat flowers, like, uh, yeah. Endless summer, I believe, is one of those ones that'll flower on first year growth. Yeah, yeah, some of the new cultivar cultivars do that. Now, Barbara um, says, my Arbutus anito uh, uh, um, is, uh, their leaves are turning yellow and have brown spots. Um, my my Onido uh, is quite young. Um, it had a similar problem. There is um, a leaf spot that the Arbutus uh, compacta is susceptible to. And mine was out in more weather than I wanted it to be. And because it doesn't like the wet, um, it, uh, it took quite a hit, but it's recovering. Um, now, 12 years old, is it in the ground or is it in a pot? That would be my first question, because I mean, mine is just a, a three year old that I'm beginning to train for a bonsai. And right. I deliberately left it out to see if it was tough enough. Can but she it tell it, you that? It took whether a beating. it's in a pot or the container? No. In the ground? She just says it's uh, leaves are turning yellow and many brown spots. It's 12 years old. Oh. I wonder if she's actually fertilizes it on a regular basis. If it's in or, a or if it's too wet. Yeah, that could be another thing. Yeah, it sounds like it's too wet. Also, people forget that the Arbutus, just like the rhododendron, every few years, they lose their leaves. Mm. Um, they they go through, a, a yes, a constant new leaf growth, but then every few years, they get rid of a whole bunch of them and start new ones. So yeah. it's hard, so it's hard to tell. Right. So people should realize that a broadleaf evergreen or even just a, a, a coniferous evergreen, it doesn't mean that they're not going to lose their leaves. They still, they lose their leaves, but they don't, they're not deciduous. They don't lose them all at once every fall and then grow new ones. Well, there are a few yeah. deciduous conifers, but in general, we're talking about broadleaf evergreens. They are always dropping leaves, right? Rhododendrons in particular drop, some, some drop them, uh, just shortly after they bring out the new spring growth, but some retain the old leaves for two or three years. So if you know the cultivar, you can always look it up at the Rhododendron Society, American Rhododendron Society, and in there it'll tell you how long the leaves normally stay on the roto before they actually drop off. More questions? Um, there's one here um, that tough. Uh, oh, from Phyllis. Um, hi, Phyllis. Um, she says her Japanese fern gets rust on the leaves. Wondering how common that is. Is that a painted fern? Japanese fern. What's a Japanese fern? What, maybe know. it's the painted fern. Uh, Phyllis, could you uh, let us know? Okay, Barbara's plant is in the ground. Ah. She could try mulching. Yeah. And the Japanese fern is actually, dis it, it loses its leaves in the wintertime. So uh, if it's got rust or fungus this year, chances are next year it'll be fine. I don't know. I don't. I, I personally don't know what to do about about that. I haven't seen that, and I'm not sure. I, it's a small plant, so if it gets pretty bad, I don't know if it's going to recover. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear my dog? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, um, I'm not familiar with the uh, Inca Magnifica. Um, I'll take a quick look and see what I can find out for uh, Terry, a large, a large leaf plant.
Robin's just stating that uh, to be careful because some cardboard is coated with a wet proofing coating on it and it doesn't. Well, that's true. Yes. And I'd decompose as well. Right. So, I, I mean, I wouldn't want to do that for a food garden. And also, um, you know, some some cardboards have uh, like a printed paper color markings, whatever you call it, like a photo right. on them. So I don't know. I, I would want to have the other side of the cardboard on, against the soil if I was going to be planting in that for food. Did you find out about the Inca Magnifica? Um, no, I don't. I don't see now there is there is something called an ingabella that's a tropical, but I don't I don't see uh I don't see an uh Inga Magnifica. So I, I would need I'm sorry, I would need more um information before I could answer that. Terry, sorry. there's a question in the chat from nancy uh, i have a berberous question or barbarous question about five weeks ago my husband bought a well-established five gallon pot plant planted it in full sun on a gentle slope watered it well and as well as the rain and checked constantly that it didn't dry out it died two weeks ago why So it was in a number two container. Uh, is, that, is that what she's saying? It's in a in a pot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, five gallon. A five, a five gallon. gallon. Okay, so you know what? I guess a good practice when you're buying plants at a nursery would be to kind of lift it out of the pot and see what's going on in the roots, because if it's really root bound, if it's really dry. It might even have holes in the root ball and could have like sow bugs or pill bugs infested in there. You know, you don't know all this in the nurseries. They might have really fresh plants, but maybe some plants that they're just trying to sell and they're still around. A, a bear burst can take a lot of dryness, actually, right? It's a sun plant. They're pretty tough plants, but I would say, you know, it could be just that you bought a plant that was not already, that wasn't healthy in the root system. Otherwise, why would it just up and die? Yep, I, I I quite agree, Jacqueline, and, and uh, how often we've we've pulled plants out of pots. As a matter of fact, my husband just uh, uh, transplanted um, a small yew uh, that was in our garden and needed a better space, and he pulled it up, and you could see the three areas where it had gotten root bound. They put it in a bigger pot that was root bound. They put it in a bigger pot that was root bound. So although it looked like a big plant. I took my knife, cut into it. It was completely dry mm -hmm. on the inside. And of course the plant was unhealthy, but when you look at it, it's just fine. But the, the nursery kept it alive by fertilizing the heck out of it. All right. And so right. We, 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 if we had put it in the ground the way the, the, the person with the Berberus did, it would have died. It could get no water, no food, and uh, and so you're quite right, Jacqueline, um, about taking a look at the root ball and making sure that the root ball is healthy and then spreading that root ball out into the ground. Yeah, because um, Berberus are tough and, and it didn't, uh, you know, it. You can watch, you can water it, but that gives us a good segue into uh, Deborah Gerard, who's giving an, a talk on October 7th, Root Prep for Successful Transplanting. And she will be going through root pruning and everything else on uh, nursery plants or plants that have been pot, in pots. And we'll go through the root pruning, uh, the process of uh, detangling roots and making sure they all have um, aren't growing around in circles in the pot. That really is that really is the key. It is. Do we have any other questions? Well, somebody's got in the chat. Thanks. 
of great ideas and you can uh, we have a 150 foot shady overgrown border in a new garden and really feel inspired by your plant suggestions <laughs> thank you wendy excellent well, and Jacqueline, have you found that over your years of landscaping that that people, um, first of all, don't understand what shade is, and second of all, just just kind of freak out because oh my God, it's shady and everything will die, and they they don't really realize the the breadth of of plants and what a woodland really is. Right. There's so many plants that do well in shade, right? I mean, I think there's given the choice sun or shade a lot of us would choose sun because it's summer and you want to see those bright yellows and reds and oranges and you know there's just so many sun plants with big flowers shade seems to be a little more diminutive but there's so many lovely shade plants and shade doesn't have to be dark you know we can find ways to open up the shade like we talked about just through doing a little bit of um pruning in the canopy allowing more light in um change the conditions quite a bit and just choose plants that are going to work in that in that area and there's it doesn't have to be ivy <laughs> okay, there's so a, many more choices we have a question oh, yeah. from Lynn about how much shade will a hellebore take um hellebores surprise me i could have used I, I i really like hellebores and i'm i they take dry shade really well I have seen them growing underneath cedar trees and being neglected and still blooming. So I think that's the Orientalis. I don't know that I would say that about all the hellebores because there's a there's multiple species, right? That are in there the are multiple trade. species. Yeah, but one I think thing the, they, the ones, the common ones, right? One thing they won't do is tolerate deep shade and wet. They, yeah. uh, the leaves will uh, get a fungus on them. And then right. I think they like dry better, Richard. Yeah, they do. Yeah. yeah. And once established, because that establishment is everything, they can take quite a bit of dryness. So they work quite well under trees. And, you know, we've been long recommended to grow epimediums in a place like that. But I think hellebore can work too. Uh, we have a question from Sue about reducing slug damage in the cool we weather that we've had. Ducks. <laughs> a paradox. Oh, I, in a, in another uh, uh, where I used to live, um, there was a gal that used to rent out her ducks. Yeah. And uh, uh, literally, you know, and she had the big duck cages, and she would rent rent the ducks out because, of course, they graze with the. She had a smallish type space, and uh, um, the ducks didn't have a, enough graze. So she'd bring them out in their in their cages and and they would they would eat up all the neighbors slugs they while they slugs. grazed grazed the lawn, <laughs> you know. And uh, I mean, you know, I think as a side gig, um, it's a great idea, you know. Um, you could just you could buy ducks. Well, that's... or what if you can do it and then send out their ads to everybody here, so only one person charge for your ducks. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> someone said it sounded quackers. <laughs> <laughs> My chickens will also eat little slugs. But they also eat everything else and scratch the heck out of things. Right. You don't yeah. want. Do ducks do and that? Ducks do too. They'll eat your plants. <laughs> My daughter has ducks and I know this, right? That she oh. has to start penning the ducks because they go around the yard and yeah, they're great at scooping up all the slugs and, and uh, critters like that, but they'll also they'll also rip up your plants. So Joe had trained ducks. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, that's okay. I love my, ducks. my my ducks were well behaved <laughs> and and uh just like my cats, you know. They... What I've what I've done for slugs is I've just put a piece of wood on the ground. And then the next day or in the morning, I just pick the wood up and get rid of all the slugs on it. I think that's really good advice. Forest. And you and know. learn what slug eggs look like. Yeah. And discard those. That's it, exactly. Good, good point. And I I used to, I just used to do uh slug slug and caterpillar patrol every morning. It was just something that that you did. If you have a shady garden, you're gonna have more more of those uh, critters. And um, 
I would just take my espresso out in the morning and go slug hunting. Uh, and uh, in the evening when I had places like uh, uh, that where I knew the slugs were, as as Richard says, putting down that board to give them a place to, to sleep. Um, and then they all go there and sleep and then you go out and you murder them the next day. It's, it's really, it's, I, I got a lot of joy out of it, you know? You know, get get angry at the hubby, go out and kill a slug. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, it, it's How very therapeutic. How many you kill? Thousands. <laughs> <laughs> this is our second one in a row where we've seen some murderous tendencies from Joe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not known to be a shrinking violet. <laughs> Great. Well... Yes. I think we're at the end of the time, but we're going to send out the link for the recording and for everybody to sign up for the other sessions as well. As Richard said, the next one is him doing the small space design. Mm -hmm. um, is it born out of current experience, Richard? Yes. Yes. I had a half acre and now I have 0.16 and 40% of that is house. Okay, we look that forward to what you've done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everybody for being here. Thank you so much to Jacqueline for uh, the great organized presentation and Joe and Richard for helping and April for being in the background, making sure everything worked. Thank you for your questions and we hope to see you next time.